So the topic of this session is just a bit about the platform aspect. How can we help uh, the clinical side access this type of innovation that we've seen throughout the day uh, through the use of different types of platforms? And uh, my name is Frederick, and feel free to reach out afterwards if you want to have further discussions. So as we've learned during the day, there's tremendous potential in AI. We've heard many different companies talk about many different clinical aspects and integration aspects. So we see that AI has the potential to increase productivity of the diagnostic process, both for radiology and pathology and cardiology. We also see opportunities that the Chiron guys talked about. Maybe AI can see more than a human can in some respect, different things, things that are not visible to the naked eye. And it has potential to improve the diagnostic consistency, to, Im to reduce <coughs> variability between readers. And this is something that, when we talk to our customer base, there's a lot of interest and drive to adopt these things. But to some respect, I'm, I'm going to be the boring guy at this party. We are not really there. We're not at the point where we can just sit back, relax, and say, it's done and dusted. Let's go. When we talk to our customers, we find that there is, I, I'm not going to say fear, but, but there is a definite, definite concern about the barriers of adoption that prevents them from taking that leap to go from, from research or from PowerPoints and presentations into the clinical routine. So what can we do to help bridge some of these barriers of adoption? I'd like to highlight three things, but I'd also like to highlight the role of the PACs. Now, I'm heavily biased, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. But to a fair degree, I believe that PACs or the enterprise imaging platform is where these things will fail or succeed. Because if you employ these different algorithms or innovations, and the result is that this is the everyday work for a radiologist, it's not going to work. If you have to jump between 10 different systems because you have 10 different algorithms, that's not going to work. So you need to find a way to bridge these difficulties and bring these systems into a whole. And that whole, for many use cases, would be the PACS or the enterprise imaging or the VNA system. So the first topic that I would like to raise is something that we've touched a couple of times during the day. How do we access this type of innovation? And what are these barriers that we hear vendors to, or, or the clinical representatives or the hospitals talk about? And I'd like to raise four, four topics or four aspects. So one is, what does it take to procure something, to do the contracting, to do the legal reviews, to have agreement on division of responsibility, division of, of support labor? How do you contract? This, different, this algorithm, and if you do it for, for one, does it scale? Can you do this for 10? A second topic regards your IT and infrastructure. Ninke raised that topic, and someone said, let's go cloud. But it is a topic. You need to consider your IT strategy, your IT infrastructure. You need to ensure that these algorithms or products support your IT strategy, whether it's on-prem or whether it's cloud. And what about the security perspective? I had a discussion just over here a half an hour ago. Is maybe security an aspect? How, how much due diligence do you need to do to be comfortable having these applications in your ecosystem, regardless if it's on-prem or in the cloud? How do you audit them? And we've talked about integration all day. How do you get there? If you buy something from, from one party, how do you ensure that it actually works with your PACs or your VNA or your RIS or your reporting solution? All of this needs to come, to come together. So there's a, a number of challenges, and there are, they are overcomable. We've seen customers talk about that. We've seen clinical partners talk about uh, that. But it is a challenge, and it has scaling issues. It's fine to do for one, for two. But for 10 or 15, if, if we see that that is probably what 
healthcare needs down the line is a number of these algorithms that together create a whole. So we recognize that as a vendor. And throughout this year or, or the previous two years, we've had so many of our customers come to us to say, help us with this. We need to do this, but can we do it together? So we are moving into a position where we aim to solve this for our customers, to deliver these applications both on-prem as cloud services, depending on your IT strategy. This is not going to be the thing that drives a customer pure cloud. So we need to be supportive of the IT strategy that you have. And having a single point of contracting and building and invoicing to be Sectra, regardless of who the clinical partner is. And for us to own up to security and integration. We can't be responsible for the clinical accuracy of these algorithms, but we can be responsible for making sure that integration actually works. We're sitting on both, both sides here. We're both providing access to the applications and the clinical workflows. So we're, we're equipped to take that responsibility. So in, in, in some respect, there are two components to it. One is providing a catalog of these applications. We've seen a bunch of them today. They will grow into more. And the other part is provisioning this into the hospital ecosystem, including the integration. So this is something, a journey that we're starting or, or in the early phase of now. Our aim is to run a couple of pilots this year. So if you do uh, find that, I want to be in the forefront. I'm equipped and able to do this fairly short term. Reach out to your Sectra representatives to say, I want to be part of this. And I can't promise a seat for everyone, but we aim to do a handful of pilots this year on some different markets. So the timing is right. It's not going to be limited to that. We're going to move that into more markets and more products during the next year. But this is something that we're aiming to do now, and to do it together with our, our commercial partners and with our clinical partners. So this access to different application is the first example of an ecosystem. But we've talked about workflow integration all day. I'd like to highlight some of the benefits of doing it a standards way, doing it with an open way. And I'd like to do it by exemplifying two different perspectives, and we've talked about them throughout the day. One is the workflow perspective that we've seen, for instance, with Cure. And a second one is about the diagnostic process, finding lesions, measuring lesions, and, and, and qualification of characteristics of lesions. So those two aspects I'd like to highlight a bit about what can we do through integrations. And you've seen much of that already during the sessions. So what can be done in terms of workflow? Well, you can use a workflow integration for many different things. We've seen that you can map incoming data into a clinical urgency. You can use that in turn to maybe set an, an SLA or, or uh, count down that this needs to be reported within 15 minutes because it is really urgent, or within two hours because it, it is fairly urgent, and having the system show that to you as a user. Automated double reading had a long and good discussion with the, with the Chiron guys. Now, that is easy to say and hard to do, especially if you have a multi-vendor ecosystem where you have a reporting solution from one vendor, and now you have an imaging system from a second vendor. It is overcomable, and this is where this will succeed or fail, if we get the workflows right. So some examples that we've seen during the day, and for the recall or callback perspectives from Chiron as well. How does that work in practice? From a technology perspective, all we get inbound is HL7 and DICOM objects, just standardized. That gives us enough freedom of interpretation to solve, at least for now, the clinical needs we see. That in, in our system then has a standard input, 
and then we have flexible business rules and scripting. So it's not going to be one place where you store these things. It's going to be hidden in different types of tags because the standard is fairly loose. So our system needs to be able to pull that information from different types of elements, from different H7 codes or DICOM fields. But it's still standards-based. You can still send that from any system in, regardless if the vendor is Cure or if the vendor is Zebra. Same standardized inputs. Moving to the, the diagnostic process, we see a similar thing that we can have a, a single input and then have multiple diagnostic benefits in terms of integrating that into the image display, but also into the report. And generally, when we talk to these vendors, we're together doing a, a journey from unstructured to structured data exchange. The starting point is usually, at least for companies that are new to the healthcare industry, that their, their output is a new set of images with burnt in things. And I think very few of the IT managers would jump for joy if I give you a thousand new images for every thousand slice chest CT. So that, that has issues of, of creating another set of DICOM images. More images to review, but also more images to store and, and handle. So during this, this collaborative process with the different vendors, we're generally coaching to say, you can do something with metadata through DICOM. It is a, a pretty amazing standard. So you can do something like grayscale presentation states, where you store the metadata or the graphics you want to display and display that on top of the source image. So instead of half a gig of data, it's half a kilobyte of data. Not a thousand more images, but drawings and graphics and texts on top that a user can toggle on and off, show and hide, that can scale when you zoom. So that's the journey that we're doing together with these vendors is, is to together see how can we move from duplicating data into enriching data. And especially when you come down to the bottom tier where you say, I want to understand the data. It's not just text that I draw on top of images. I want to reason, make, make reason and, and understand the data that we're exchanging. There we can start to do powerful things, as we've shown today. So when we're past structured data, for instance, in this case, information about a detected lung nodule. We can convert that into a measurement, a measurement that a user can interact with, show and hide, adjust, correct, move, delete. So it becomes alive, and we can interpret that information. We can also map that into a lesion concept to understand volumetric growth or placement of lesions across time and automatically insert that into a report because it's structured data that we can understand and interpret and not just blank text that is for us to display or not display. When we're fairly early assessed this opportunity of doing structured data exchange, some of the concerns that we were hearing in the clinical field is, yeah, but they're not always right. You know, and I, when you create that structured data and push that into the system, it's going to be there forever, true or false. I need to be in control. We need to put the human in the middle of this pipeline to say, this is right and this is wrong. The sorting hat in the, in the Potter movies. So that's a concept that we're now exploring and building together with these different vendors. Again, in a standardized way, the input is an SR object that contains these, for us, unverified findings. It's up to a clinical professional to say, verified, approved, rejected, or ignored. Perhaps it's fine to ignore some lesions and, and let them be hanging there. But I want to understand, has a decision been made? That's generating more knowledge. Now, some of the, uh, it may not always be the ideal scenario for for ADENS, for instance, but one of the benefits of having this structured input and a structured workflow is that it is loosely coupled to the algorithm. 
So the clinical side will be pushing the vendors to win because they're the best, and not because they're sticky. If you decouple the workflow from the algorithm, you can have the same workflow from a different vendor. You don't have to retrain radiologists or clinicians or experts just because you want a new algorithm. So it, it pushes the algorithm performance to be the decision factor and not IT or training radiologists. It's also another advantage that you don't have to have five different workflows regard if you're tracking lung lesions or breast lesions or liver lesions or brain lesions. It should be the same concept. So this is a generalizable concept. So in theory, because that's brutally honest, in theory we can now do structured data exchange with a number of different stakeholders. It could be upstream IT systems like an EMR, or it could be specialist systems, it could be cancer registries, based on, for instance, fire as structured data exchange, or common data elements to describe what the finding is. I think this is, here we're fairly early in the maturity journey, but we're laying the foundation by creating structured data exchange between the algorithms and the PACs and VNA platforms. As the upstream systems mature and support the data exchange, I think that will happen down the line. But building for that future already now, I think, makes sense. Start collecting that structured data. And the importance of keeping the human in the loop is just as important for pathology. We talked about that during the morning. So we do some own development within pathology and also integrate third parties but always with a human in the loop. Have it easy to correct and adjust, because that's when you create a positive feedback loop. The algorithm performance can be improved based on what you teach it. So finally, is there a place for AI beyond supporting the diagnostic process? We've talked about looking at the images to understand the pathology to increase the criticality of a study, or to measure things, or find things. But is there a place for AI to just make our systems smarter? Or, or maybe smart isn't the only personal trait that a system could have. What about, what about forgiving? Is, is forgiving something that a system can be? I know that you have a display protocol that is set up for MR liver with six series. I only have five, or seven, or three. It's almost the same. I'll do my best. Current systems generally are fairly rigid. It's either right or it's wrong. But if, if we could help the system with properties that says, this is close enough, or I'll do my best, I think this will be good. It's a good starting point, and you can build from there. So that is one area that we at Sectra are investing the majority of our own AI research is in those aspects, together with the integration. Because we see that the pool of innovation for detecting and finding the clinical side, we do the best work here by working on the integration and having 100 companies excel at the detection side. But making a system that is forgiving or adapting to personal needs or learning of the way you work. Only we can do that for our systems. So that's where we spend our investments at this stage. I'm not saying we're not going to do uh, the world's best finder of liver lesions. But at least now, we see that we create the most bang for the buck focusing on integration and making a smarter or more flexible core system. So an example of what we've done the last year is this case here, where you have five or six types of MR scans, different series descriptions, different exam descriptions, partially overlapping types of series, but they're named differently because they were taken at different facilities. But the system, as you click a series, it will highlight what it thinks is the appropriate comparison. 
And that's not based on, on, uh, on uh, having the same series description. It looks at all the DICOM tags and says, this is my best guess. I think this is what you should compare with. This is an example, and this is an area that we're putting big focus on, because we see that as the complexity of the environment increases, more exchange of studies from the outside, having a system that is reliant on hard rules, it's bound to fail. So in the end, is that going to be all it takes for your, your clinical teams to access this global pool of innovation? Of course not. I think it's a good starting point. And we want to do this by, by again, tackling these three core concepts, helping with just provisioning of these algorithms and making sure that we own up to the workflows, work together with these application developers to own up to the end result for the radiologists and pathologists. And spending our research investments into a smarter system, not just looking at the diagnostic findings. All right, that is it for me. <laughs>